It's not much of a red carpet welcome, but for this boy, it's at least the first time he's touched dry land in five days. He'll have spent that time in a fishing boat with around 25 other people crossing rough Atlantic seas from West Africa. The Canary Islands is experiencing the largest wave of migrant and refugee arrivals in 15 years, and with it what the regional government calls a significant upturn in the number of children. International aid group Save the Children is concerned that the authorities here are struggling to provide for the specific needs of minors. They are in overcrowded condition. After making this a life-threatening uh, street crossing, they will need uh, psychological support uh, because of what they have seen and gone through. For example, they have seen people dying on board and being thrown into the sea. Uh, they have suffered from the lack of food and some might have experienced violence and, of course, separation from their parents. So all these uh, factors, they, well, they kind of scare the the children for life. We were at sea for six days, dear warrior tells me. Six days. He and his friend Modibu are 16 years old. They're from Mali. In Mali, there's a war now, so we came here. My mother and father are over there, and they are getting old, and now there's no money, so I left and came here. There were more than 8,000 migrant and refugee arrivals just in November, breaking previous records. Spain's migration minister has suggested transferring migrants to the mainland to relieve the pressure here, but that's been rejected by other ministers saying he'll just encourage others. So, new arrivals are being transferred to these military bases or being kept in hotels. Unaccompanied children are less likely than adults to be sent back to their home country. Mam Sheikh Mbay, who runs an aid group that helps African migrants, thinks this is why there are more minors making the trip. Each young person is a community project. They're not coming on their own. They've got their parents behind them. They look for a strategy to make their project successful, and they know that their children have more chance to be able to stay in Europe because it's the law. The Canary Islands government says it's opened 21 emergency centres for unaccompanied minors. It says it's repeatedly asked the Spanish government and the EU for more money. $12 million has now been promised by the end of the year, not as fast as the migrants and refugees keep arriving. Well, we have correspondents on both sides of this crisis. In a minute, we'll go to Nicholas Huck, who's in Tambacunda in Senegal. It's a major transit area for West African uh, migrants heading to the Canary Islands. But first, let's head to Bernard Smith, who's in Gran Canaria for us. Uh, Bernard, the Canary Islands are quite some distance uh, from the African continent. And children, we're not really seeing as many children, we're now seeing more children making this journey. Just why are people making this journey from uh, the African continent to the Canary Islands? It seems fraught with so much risk. Well, Hala, part of it's economic, as Nick may explain later on, and some of it's a, a practical. They get in these boats off the West African uh, coast maybe 25 or so people in each one of them making maybe a five or six day journey across the water simply because this is now the easiest way to get to European territory. It's much harder to cross from Libya and Morocco across the Mediterranean to Europe now because of increased funding for patrols, maritime patrols for the Libyans and the Moroccan Coast Guard, money given by the Europeans. So instead, those migrants are coming this way because there's less patrols along the West African coast, so it's easier for them to make it over. Most of them coming at the moment are from Morocco. And... Uh... Bernard, just uh, the local authorities initially were caught off guard by the sudden increase of people arriving on their shores, sleeping uh, for weeks on the dockside where you are. Um, how are they able to deal with it now? Are they getting a, a, a better handle on the situation? Yeah, this is the, the dock side here, the quay side, just this concrete and tarmac surface was where thousands of migrants were sleeping for several weeks before the authorities managed to quickly put up some uh, tent camps on military bases and they were using hotels that are empty at the moment that would otherwise have been full of tourists 
because there are, but there aren't at the moment because of COVID. And just yesterday, on Monday, they've restarted repatriation flights from the Canaries to Morocco. They been, hadn't been happening for many months because of COVID. 22 migrants were on a flight yesterday. They hope to increase that to 80 uh, a day or 80 per flight. Doesn't sound like many, but the authorities say here, just to show people are being quickly sent back, they believe, they hope, is enough of a deterrent to stop people making that perilous journey. OK, uh, Bernard Smith, uh, live for us in Gran Canaria. For now, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's get the view from Senegal now, where we can join Nicholas Huck, who's in Tambacounda. Uh, Nick, this is clearly a much longer and more dangerous route. The welcome mat, as we were hearing, has not been rolled out. So why are so many people making this dangerous journey? Well, Hala, we're in Tambacounda, which used to be an industrial hub where migrants used to come and work into the cotton mills. It has turned into a transit point for migrants from across the region to come and then make their way to boats, then on to Spain and to the Canary Islands, as Bernard explained. Now, all these migrants, some of them come from Mali, uh, fleeing war and the, 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 the crisis over there. Others come from Guinea, fleeing the political crisis in Guinea. But among those migrants are also certainly a lot of Senegalese. Now, we're inside a technical high school. Let me show you inside one of these classrooms. These children here, well, most of their parents are farmers, and they tell us that through the years, the farming has become increasingly difficult. You have parents who herd cattle, and they're unable to feed their, their animals. And if you speak to these young people here, most of them don't want to take up their parents' job. Here, they're learning how to become electricians, except we're in a country where most people don't have access to electricity. It's the lack of opportunities here, Hala, that are pushing these young people to go abroad. I spoke to the principal of this high school. He told me that every week there's someone going missing, someone going off trying to make it to Europe. It appears so close. Um, they can see it through their uh, Facebook pages, through social media, that so many have made it across. And they know, as minors, that they have more opportunities to stay in those countries. And that's what's pushing them. They're not fleeing war or persecution. They're looking for opportunities that they don't have at home. 17% unemployment rate here in Senegal. And despite all these skills that they're learning at school, well, there's no jobs at the end of it. And that's what's pushing these young people to leave. There's also this rumor that because of the coronavirus, a lot of young people, a lot of old people in Europe are dying and there are jobs to be taken by young Senegalese or Africans. And that's what's pushing so many people to leave Tambacounda and to head towards the Canary Islands. Hala? Okay, Nicholas Hack there, live for us in Senegal. Thank you.